In here I'm resolved in interviewing parents for christenings as a vicar that after the niceties of explaining the liturgy, because there's a kind of anxiety in those interviews when you're talking to parents, are they going to give you a grilling? And I'm anxious that they're anxious and they're anxious that I'm anxious. And they're going to have to publicly, of course, renounce the devil and all his works. After those niceties, I found recently that the way to get to them and to get a good response is to say, where are you going to go with your child in 2030? When, as a seven-year-old, they come to you and say, Everybody else has the latest tech, an implant in the skull. It's coming. Mum, Dad, why can't I have this? What are you going to say to them? What are you going to say to them at eight years old when they say, I think I want to change my gender and my pronouns because apparently one in ten already do. What are you going to say to them at nine? When they'll say that they've learned at school that the Bible is bunkum, backward, as with all religion. What are you going to say at ten when they now identify as a cat? What are you going to say at eleven when they tell you that all history is rubbish? When they tell you at twelve that men are mainly toxic? And at 13, women have penises, and they've learned this at biology. At 14, that polyamory is an acceptable life choice. And at 15, being a parent is pointless. And at 16, when they tell you, they've actually reported you. Because though you've not had the audacity to report them, you failed to insufficiently affirm their life choices, which means that you're probably dodgy and alt-right. What are you going to do? You need an ark. And this is where Rod Dreher, in his seminal book, The Benedict Option, published in 2017, and his sequel, Live Not By Lies, which was branded by so many as black pill and alarmist, and who's laughing now, is so prophetic, and I want to talk into. These parents and their christenings, in these interviews, they need a viable shield. They need an ark that they can inhabit. They need to grasp their faith that they're going to profess at the faint, at the font, and know that there's a costly price to that. And that's okay, because we as churches are going to support and resource them. Rod has said that the most important thing we can be thinking of at this moment is how we ensure the church's survival through this new dark age. He and I have spoken about the stats Peter mentioned at the beginning. Did you know that in this country, the prospect is that a large number of Protestant churches will go extinct within the next decade or so? Anglican and Catholic churches are set to expire by 2060 and 2070. There may be some evangelical churches left with life in them, but they'll be lucky to reach the end of the century. In the UK and throughout the West, the 21st century will be to the Christian what the 4th century was to Roman paganism. Barring a miracle, this century will go down as the one in which our civilization abandoned its ancestral religion. And yet, and yet, there are few signs of any of the leadership in any of the churches that is so, so necessary. In his book, Edward J. Watts' The Final Pagan Generation, and if you've read any Edward Norman, he also picks up on this. 
Many pagans in the fourth century didn't see Christianity coming. The pagan clergy went around in their, in their fancy robes, their semi-empty temples, giving themselves grand titles. All of Rome had been pagan, hadn't it? Many of the older Romans who'd been raised in a recognizable pagan culture went to their graves uncomprehending what was coming. Rod Dreher, in his work, is so keen for us to know that we should not simply sleepwalk into a post-Christian future. To judge the things from these clerics and lay church leaders is to say and do today, and by what they do not say and do, history could so easily repeat itself. What are we to do? The Benedict option, if you haven't heard of it, is taken from the example of St. Benedict of Nursia and the early Benedictine monks. We don't have uh, time to discuss it all this afternoon, but in brief, it's a call to all Christians, Protestants, Catholic, Orthodox, to establish a disciplined, prayerful, historical, rooted, and consciously countercultural way of living out the faith. When Benedict fled the fall of the Roman Empire for the forest around the turn of the sixth century, he set out only to create a resilient way of living in Christian community, but it became a strategy and a rule that would survive the dark ages. What is your ark? How are you going to survive the deluge that is coming before us? This is not a call to abandon the world, but to be prepared for what is coming, to live faithfully in a post-Christian world, to have a conscious, strategic retreat where we build each other up, to be able to know the faith that we're passing on and why it's important. Time is running out. And though this might seem alarmist to some, I think we are coming near to the time when we may have to build Christianity as an underground movement with subterranean networks. That might seem crazy, but if you look at the example of Christians in the Soviet period, it was all there. And what before us now is not necessarily jackboot totalitarianism, but a soft, Huxleyan, brave new world where we can have everything but truth. Rod, in his book, Live Not By Lies, gives the heroic example of the little known Father Tomislav Kolakovich. He was the sort of St. Benedict of, of his time. In 1943, Kolakovich had been doing anti Nazi work in Zagreb. He received a tip that the Gestapo was coming from him. He escaped to the Slovak capital and began teaching in the Catholic University there. He told his students the Germans were going to lose the war, but in the end the Soviets would be ruling their country. And what he said would happen would that they would bitterly persecute the church. The exiled priest set himself to preparing his flock spiritually and materially for that resistance. Within three years, most of the towns in Slovakia had small Kolakovich groups. They built up networks. In that, they did Bible study and fellowship. They studied the adversary that was coming. And the official church, what of them? They laughed it all off. Does that sound familiar? They thought they could negotiate with the enemy, uh, that they could placate them. The communists wouldn't be that bad. And of course, we all know what happened. And the Kolakovich communities were the ones that were sustained and flourished, prepared 
for the time ahead. Do you know Philip Larkin's poem, Myxomatosis? You may have thought things would come right again, if only keep quite still and wait. Perhaps you think this is all very gloomy, but is it weak and cowardly to refuse to face facts? So where is all the hope in, in this? Christianity, at the end, is a religion of hope. And that's not the same as optimism. An optimist believes that everything can only get better, but that's not always true. We're not going to get out of this, you know, we're just a little bit of elbow grease. A hopeful Christian, on the other hand, wants to get things better, but he knows that this may be a long-term investment. The suffering has to be given meaning, even embraced. There's a spirituality there of the exile. I was speaking to someone this morning who said to me that they're interested in ministry but realize that the years ahead would be that not dissimilar to the exiles in the time of Babylon in the scriptures. They had to take into themselves a spirituality of the exile to become resilient in that way. And boy, in this country do we have examples of great saints on all sides of the religious divide, Ridley, Latimer, Moore, Fisher, Campion. These are people that we can look up to and teach. How, do we ever hear about these in our school curriculums? Why not? Against all the odds, Benedict was able to give the seeds to a new civilization. I think I want to underline one particular point that Rod and I would bang on over and over again, and that is that we have to work together on this. For Christians, if we form a circle and just start shooting each other, the exile won't be 70 years, it'll be 700. Let's embrace a generous orthodoxy, not toxic tribalism. Let our arcs be broad, lest they sink in the deluge of liquid maternity. I'd like to conclude with the words of Christ. Jesus said, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world and in the world of tomorrow, we will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Thank you very much.